The way we pick our projects here is very simple. There's got to be a fundamental, important human need. And we have to believe that the current state of technology finally allows for a radically different approach than what's already being done, so we can make a big change. I got into the innovation business, so to speak, because I didn't think anybody would hire me to do a normal job. I think it's exciting to look at the world as it is. Imagine how it might be if technology were applied in a new and different way to solve some human need, and then set about trying to do that. Uh, it's frustrating, it's difficult, most of the time it doesn't work, but you only have to get it right once in a while to be able to uh, try again. If you're looking for solving important human needs, medical needs, always get near the top of the list. But we also work on programs to change the way kids think about science and technology, change the culture of the country with a program like our first robotics competition, or build water machines that can bring clean, safe water to well over a billion people that don't have it in the developing world. We do lots of new and interesting things. Somebody in a wheelchair can get around as long as they're on a smooth, hard surface, a tile floor or a sidewalk. Believe it or not, most of the world isn't available to people that can only run on smooth tile floors and sidewalks. What do you do when you get to a curb or a flight of stairs or a park where there's grass or there's woods where there's a trail? So we built this device and it can literally stand a person up. It balances on two wheels. Uh, it can leave you at eye level with your peers. It brings not just mobility, therefore, but dignity and access. It walks up and down stairs. It can easily go on the beach. Uh, it goes up and down curbs. And it gives people mobility, access, and dignity that literally was unheard of before the iBot. We took the technology we developed for the iBot and turned it into a product that the able body community uh, could use. Uh, take the cluster off it, take the seat off it, and it's called a Segway. And uh, it allows a pedestrian to go two or three hundred percent faster than they could go otherwise. Most people are pretty happy when something improves by 10 percent or 20 percent. We double or triple your average speed cruising around the sidewalks, going from place to place short distance. So it's a clean, environmentally friendly, fun way to shorten those uh, distances and times uh, when it's just not practical to get into a car, but it's a little too far to walk. A Segway is a nice way to go. The prosthetic arm project was actually quite unusual for DECA. The DARPA, an arm of the Department of Defense, came to us and said, they now have over 1,600 kids that have come back from the various conflicts, particularly Iraq, missing entire arms because of IEDs, improvised explosive devices. It, these kids aren't being killed, fortunately, because they can wear body armor, but a lot of them are losing hands to the elbow, to the shoulder. They said that it was unacceptable in the 21st century to put basically a plastic or wooden stick back on there with a hook on the end. We did that during the Civil War. They asked us what we could do and they expected a fully articulated arm with a hand, with fingers, with a working elbow, with a shoulder that could flex and abduct. And they wanted it to weigh about what the original equipment weighs. And they wanted it self-powered and they wanted it to communicate with the brain so that it would be functional. And we've spent a couple of years doing that. We have our first uh, prosthetic arms on a number of people now, and they are incredibly uh, uh, capable of adapting to these arms. Virtually every one of the people that's testing them now is able to, for instance, pick up a glass with a grip, rotate at the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder, drink from it, and put the glass down. And that's astounding, and it's giving us great uh, encouragement and energy to keep moving further and faster. It's sad that so many kids in the United States in particular in our culture, women and minorities, uh, somehow believe science and engineering is intimidating. It's difficult. It's only for a few people. And the fact is 
<clears throat> most of the exciting jobs for the next generation of kids will require a good understanding of science and technology. To break down that stereotypical perspective that science and technology aren't fun, aren't accessible, aren't rewarding, we started a nonprofit organization called FIRST to bring science and technology into the arena of sports and excitement and we're hoping that every kid in this country has opportunity to experience the first event and we're confident that if they do it'll change uh, their attitude about science and technology. I don't think I'm in the place in life where it's time to look back and think about what we used to do. Every day I come into work looking for what's the next big thing we can solve and every year I hope to do something bigger and better than the year before. We have more people, we have more resources, we have more experience and knowledge. The world seems to be in more need of really big ideas. So my answer to the question, what's the biggest thing we did? It didn't happen yet.